Welcome everyone to the What's New in SOLIDWORKS 2019 presentation on simulation, flow, and plastics. My name is Damon Tordini. I'm one of the product managers here at Hawkridge Systems. And along with me as well is uh, Silvio Perez. He is also one of our product managers and combined uh, both of us focus on the simulation products for Hawkridge, uh, including SOLIDWORKS simulation. And we're going to be taking you through a presentation over the next 45 minutes or so about the new enhancements in SOLIDWORKS 2019 that focus on these three add-ins for SOLIDWORKS and what new capabilities that they are going to provide you guys when everyone upgrades to 2019 in terms of design validation and analysis. So we're going to be starting off by covering some of the enhancements for SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. Uh, which of course is our CFD tool, if you're not familiar, uh, for simulating all the fluid flow and uh, heat transfer problems that you might have on your SOLIDWORKS designs. And then we'll, uh, after that, proceed to looking at the enhancements for SOLIDWORKS Plastics, which is our injection molding simulation tool it's for predicting the plastic injection molding process, the manufacturing process, to see uh, what the quality and uh, production speed of your plastic parts is. And then I'll be passing it over to Silvio, who will wrap up the presentation by looking at SOLIDWORKS simulation and uh, some of the FEA and structural capabilities that have been added for 2019. So to start off, with SOLIDWORKS flow simulation, uh, again, this is the CFD analysis tool built inside of SOLIDWORKS, uh, which is a wide ranging tool that has a lot of capabilities, but one of the most common uses uh, for SOLIDWORKS flow simulation, especially among our customers here at Hawker Systems, is to evaluate heat transfer and uh, electronics cooling. And so there's a really cool enhancement for 2019 that I'm gonna show you that gives you a new type of result plot, which is sort of a graphical diagram that explains how the heat is being transferred around between different components in your assembly. And that will allow you to, to see not just from visual results on the model, but through this new result graph, this kind of schematic, um, it'll let you see which components are really contributing the most heat and what's causing the other components to uh, maybe heat up more than you expected. So I'll be showing you that in a second here. In conjunction with that, if you are then gonna go look at some surface uh, uh, results or maybe a cut plot, which is kind of like a section plane of your results, you'll be able to see surface parameters on that section plane as well now. Uh, so for example, if you wanna know what the volume or mass flow rate is, you won't have to go create a special kind of uh, goal or measurement plane or anything like that in advance, you'll be able to get that kind of feedback in real time when you're looking at your cut plot results. So let's take a look at a couple of those things first. And while we're going into SOLIDWORKS, I will also show you uh, briefly that there is an enhancement to the custom visualization parameters. These are special um, user-defined result plots that you can create. For example, if you wanted to see uh, velocity, but only in the y direction, uh, you can create that. And you can put in simple mathematical formulas to uh, to combine those things. For example, you know, one velocity in one direction plus velocity in another. And we've added some capabilities in 2019 where you can now also have uh, mathematical expressions and logical expressions in those results too. So if statements or, or and statements. So let's jump into SOLIDWORKS and I'll show you a couple of those things. So this is SOLIDWORKS 2019. Again, the user interface is uh, gonna be very familiar for the rest of you that uh, have already used SOLIDWORKS uh, 2018 or other recent releases. And I can go ahead and turn on the flow simulation add-in for SOLIDWORKS just by clicking the button on the command manager there. And so this is a kind of a simplified power supply model that I've got. We've actually had this example for quite a while, but uh, Let's see if we can teach it some new tricks in 2019. And so one of the things I wanna show you is, as I mentioned before, if I, let's say I'm running a, a thermal analysis on an assembly like this, and I've got several different heat sources in this assembly. For example, I've got 
oh, so like five watts of heat from this large capacitor, maybe four watts on these transformers. And I've also got uh, what we call the two resistor components defined over here for these chips. Uh, this is a special input condition in the electronics cooling module for flow simulation that lets you put in the data you would get on the spec sheet for that chip. And so I've got all of these heat generating components in my simulation. And of course, I've always been able to run my analysis and then load up my results and get things like the temperatures of the chips or, for example, a graphical plot of temperatures on the actual components. But if you wanted to find out what each of these components is sort of contributing to the other, how much heat is being sent between them, it was kind of hard to do uh, by just you know, looking at these kind of visual surface plots or you know, trying to do math in your head uh, or you know, on paper when you went and looked at your, your heat generation results. So now there's a special new result plot a new type of schematic plot that will let you see that. And if you go to your flow simulation results, you'll see there's something called flux plot at the bottom of the list now. And so all I have to do for this flux plot is I can go and select the components that I want to be included. Like for example, uh, these transformers and maybe the chips underneath the heat sinks there and maybe this capacitor over here. Or you could even select use all components if you wanted a really big, really complex chart. And if you click OK, what you will see is this diagram that gets created for you, which you can zoom in on. And it has a list of all of the different components that I've selected, where it shows not only uh, you know, the, the heat source that is going into that component that I have defined in the project, but it also shows how much heat is being transferred from that component to the other. So for example, here you can see I've got uh, this component, which is the transformer. Okay. When I click on it, it's highlighting up there in the graphics area. And that's sending about half of a watt over here to the PCB. Or you can see here, I've got this chip. Uh, this is the first integrated circuit. And according to this, this is receiving a certain amount of heat from that component as well. You can see through the arrows there. And uh, same thing with these components down here. And so you can rearrange this and, of course, uh, take screenshots of it or save the images directly if you want to present that um, to, for example, a board layout designer who's trying to decide you know, maybe whether the components should be moved and which components are contributing heat to each other. And you can also see a pie chart. You pop this up on the screen here. And uh, that will show you, that for each of these components, uh, for example, how much heat is going in, how much heat is going out, and what the uh, proportions of that are. So again, all of this stuff can be saved to image files or just screen captured. And it's a more mathematical way to view what the contributions are from each of these components uh, to the temperatures of the system. Now, another popular way to visualize results besides just the surface plot is something called a cut plot. Some of you may have used that before. A cut plot, of course, is where you can take a section in your simulation and plot the results on it. Like, for example, velocity. You can see I've got velocity here. And so this is something that's always been in flow simulation. But if I wanted to view the properties of this cut plot as I drag it around through the model, for example, or maybe what's, uh, what's the volume flow rate or the average velocity or average temperature or any other of the parameters on that plane, there wasn't really an easy way to do it. You would have had to go in there and model an actual surface and then measure those properties on that physical boundary. Well, now in 2019, if you want to use the surface parameters result feature to measure all of those things, we can go into that parameter and rather than selecting a face, which is what we used to have to do, we now have this new option at the end here called cut plot. And I can select from the drop down menu which of the cut plots I've created in my results I want to measure from. So for example, this plot here is cut plot two. So I can select that in the drop down. And now if I hit show, I get all the parameters like I normally do down in my uh, table view at the bottom, 
but I also can see the parameters displayed here on the screen in my graphics area. And the best part is since the surface parameters are linked to this cut plot now, that means when I drag it back and forth, for example, if I want to drag it over here to see what's going on around hey, with these hey, Damon. capacitors. Hey, da hey, Damon, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, you're getting a little choppy there. Uh, it was kind of hard to, to, to hear some of that. All right, thanks for the uh, notice there, Silvio. Sorry, guys, uh, let me go back a little bit. So just to reiterate, uh, what we've got here is, is that the surface parameters, which we've always been able to create, they can now be created on the cut plot itself. So they are defined for wherever that cut plane is that I've got on the screen. So what I'm showing you here is that even though I have a cut plot showing me, in this case, velocity results, I also have all of these surface parameters, like, such as the volume flow rate uh, through that section. And if I drag the cut plot, for example, down here past these capacitors, you'll notice that all of those values in the surface parameters table up there update instantly. So now you don't have to create a special surface or geometry just to measure the properties from. You can do it directly from the cut plot as you drag it around or change the orientation. And again, this cut plot could show all the normal parameters that you've got, like velocity or temperature, or it could show those custom visualization parameters that we talked about, where you can create your own result through an equation. And if you want to do that, you can go here to the engineering database in Flow Simulation, and the menu is right here, custom visualization parameters. There's a couple predefined ones in there, like total pressure or total temperature flow rate. But again, if you want to create your own, you can do that. And as I mentioned, now in 2019, you have the ability to define uh, the same formula with logical statements like if and and or or, so that you can have the formula change depending on the condition. Cool. The last thing I want to mention is there's also an enhancement request that's been in Flow Simulation for a couple of releases now, and that was to be able to change the conditions of an electrical input, like current or voltage, and make that a function of a goal. We used to uh, not be able to do that in SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation. This is something that was available for other types of uh, heat conditions, for example, just the normal um, heat generation rate or wattage, and that's used for Cases where, for example, you want to uh, mimic a self-regulating device where, let's say, the amount of heat being generated goes down depending on how hot the device is getting. But you couldn't do it for electrical conditions before, um, but that has now been added in 2019. So if you've got, for example, a, let's say a power trace on a board or any other part of an electrical circuit where you want the current to change with the temperature of other components, you can do that now just by defining a goal on that other component and selecting that to be the goal value for the dependency. So you can see there, you, in this case, for example, I've got the current going through that capacitor changing depending on how hot the associated chip is. If it gets too hot, I'm going to drop the current down to make sure that it doesn't burn itself out. So that does it for flow simulation. Let's switch gears now and talk about SOLIDWORKS plastics and what that's been enhanced with for 2019. Um, the main enhancements for SOLIDWORKS plastics this year are the first step in what we are hoping to be uh, sort of an uh, overall paradigm shift for plastics in as far as how it works and is set up. If you've used plastics before, you'll know that one of the main differences between plastics and the other simulation tools in SOLIDWORKS is that the setup conditions for plastics are created on the mesh rather than on the SOLIDWORKS model. So from inside SOLIDWORKS, you of course generate the mesh of the part that you've created in SOLIDWORKS. And then after that step, you can go and define things like the gate location and the other setup conditions on the mesh itself. And the drawback to that was if you wanted to make a change to your design, you would have to go back and recreate the mesh, which meant that sometimes you'd have to recreate these features too, these boundary conditions. But now some of them uh, have been switched to this new geometry-based boundary condition where 
We can define them on the model before we ever create the mesh in the first place. And that means you won't have to redo them ever again. Just like when you're putting a force on a certain face in your part file for a stress analysis, or maybe a heat power on the component of uh, an assembly. So let's take a quick look at that. If I go back to SolidWorks here, let's turn off flow simulation. And I'll go ahead and turn on the SolidWorks plastics add-in instead. And I'm going to open up this part file that I was working on. This is it's just a simple kitchen knife. And uh, of course, in this case, it's got a plastic handle. So I would be molding the plastic handle there around the knife blade itself. It's kind of an insert over molding type simulation. And so again, previously, if I wanted to do a plastics fill analysis, the first step would always have to be to create the mesh of this part. And then after I've done the mesh, I could do the rest of the setup. Well, now you'll see that when you go to create a new plastics project, up at the top here, you're gonna have this new folder called Boundary Conditions Geometry Based. And if I right click on that, you'll see that I can create a few different things like, for example, the injection location right on the model itself. And that way, it won't ever have to be redefined just because I wanna change a dimension or change the material or copy the study or things like that. So I can, for example, click this face right there or any other area on the model. And the way I've done it in this example over here is I've made another configuration where I've modeled in the actual runner and gate system. And so now you can see at the top, I'm able to put in this injection location feature just by clicking on the face. So no more selecting uh, nodes or elements in the mesh. It's simply linked to that face. And uh, even if I made the sprue there uh, larger, uh, you know, let's say a bigger diameter, I wouldn't have to go change this injection location. Same thing with the mesh controls here. Just like in SolidWorks simulation, if you were doing a stress analysis and you want to refine the mesh on a particular face, like for example, the gate down here, all I got to do is click the face, type in the mesh size, and that will stay even if I want to go back and redo the mesh later. I won't have to refine this again or change what the sizing is just because I re regenerated the mesh. So we've only got that for a few of the setup conditions right now. And uh, of course, we'll see in the future uh, how that gets expanded. But uh, the other important thing too is that any of these geometry-based conditions are also saved in the SOLIDWORKS part file, just like the other simulation tools. So again, if you send this part to somebody else and you want to make sure that they are using the same gate location, the same mesh controls, or what mold temperatures, those will already be in the part. They won't have to go and redefine them. And so what that means is it's going to be faster for you to do design comparisons. Like in this case, I've got my gate sort of in the initial location here uh, where I've got some results I can look at. But if I wanted to find out what the effect would be of moving that gate, Again, previously, I would have had to go in, change the geometry, and then basically remesh the whole model and start from scratch. But now in 2019, I can simply click this button to duplicate the study. I could call this, for example, oh, maybe gate C. And when I do that, I'm going to get a new study underneath a new configuration here. All of the setup is preserved, including these uh, setup conditions on the model, which means even if I go change the geometry, like for example, if I want to move the gate here down to the end, let's go ahead and make this uh, a larger dimension so that it's towards the other end of the handle. Now you can see I've moved the entire runner system, but my injection location is still where it was, my mesh control is still where it was, and all I need to do is just go in and click this edit solid mesh button which will regenerate the mesh with all of the, the same mesh settings that I already had before. And then it's just simply a matter of hitting run. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Silvio and he's gonna wrap up with showing the enhancements in SOLIDWORKS Simulation 2019, particularly focused around the topology study, which we introduced last year. Silvio, you should be the presenter now. All right, thanks, Damon. Let me uh, 
Show my screen here. All right, well, you guys should be seeing my SolidWorks Simulation 2019 slide. Um, uh, thank you, Damon. That was some really great enhancements there for flow and plastics. I really like that heat flux uh, enhancement there. That seems like it's going to be very useful. It's something that definitely my students have, have asked for before if, if a similar functionality has existed. And I'm glad to see that it does now. Um, so I'm going to wrap up this presentation here talking about our structural tool, which is SolidWorks Simulation, and the enhancements that are you know, available to that product. Um, so you see that we have a variety of different enhancements here. And this first one that I'm going to discuss uh, relates to the SolidWorks Simulation premium users who do nonlinear analysis. So I'll be discussing what, what is available within, within that product type here. So what we're looking at is a cover assembly. And before I get into actually showing you what the enhancement is, if I refer to the static analysis, if we go back to 2018, SolidWorks gave us this functionality where you see that this cover assembly, if I were to uh, you know, pretty much show you, uh, turn off this transparency and show you how this is connected, in real life there's an actual pin running through this actual assembly here. And you see that the pin would be running through multiple faces. So the enhancement that SolidWorks gave us in 2018, specifically for linear static frequency, buckling, or even linear dynamic uh, study types, it gave us the functionality to get into the connection and define a pin connector and being able to define a multi-faced uh, pin, where prior to that enhancement, the limitation that we had before was you only really had the option to uh, select, um, uh, excuse me, select two cylindrical faces from two different bodies. So you were limited based on the amount of faces that you were able to select and the, elbow, uh, the number of bodies that you were actually connecting these pins uh, with. So the enhancement that they gave us last year was being able to uh, not have to create multiple pin connectors or potentially create a split line feature to separate uh, certain faces into two unique faces to be able to get away with defining a pin through multiple faces like what we see here. So in 2018, they gave us that functionality. So in 2019, uh, really the enhancement is, is that they gave us that functionality for a nonlinear analysis. So you see that I created this study as a linear static analysis. We can take advantage of the copy study functionality of being able to transfer in our no penetration contacts that include our pin connectors as well and transfer it to a nonlinear analysis. And when we do that, if I refer to my completed uh, study here, you see that we're now looking at a nonlinear analysis, and our setup is essentially the same where it transferred over our contacts in our pin connector. And you see now that for our pin connector here, again, we're able to select up to 10 faces to specify that a pin is going through this multi-body assembly. Right? And the real benefit comes from when you actually run the analysis. So this is just makes your life a little bit easier in terms of setup of, again, not having to define multiple pin connectors or being able to specify split faces. It allows it to do it in one single shot. And when we actually take a look at the results and load up our connector forces here, uh, you see, you'll see that we're able to see uh, the shear forces, the axial forces, the bending moment, the torque. These are the traditional outputs of what you would be able to get from a pin connector or a bolt connector. In this case, with this pin connector, since we are defining a multi-faced type of uh, input, you see that these are separated into different sections now, uh, essentially into different joints. And now, since we're, eight, we're selecting a pin is going through more than one face or more than two faces from more than two components, it's allowing us to see, again, the shear force, axial force, bending moment, and the torque at those individual uh, joints. So you see that I can just simply click on those joints and you see that it snaps to the neighboring face, so on and so forth, right? So the main functionality is we, were, we got this new enhancement from 2018 and now it's available to us for a nonlinear analysis, right? So being able to 
uh, really view the different outputs at those different faces when we define pin connectors. So a very subtle uh, enhancement there, but yet very beneficial if you're running now a nonlinear analysis. The other enhancement here comes with uh, if you utilize uh, a lot of remote loads. So before we get into the actual enhancement, what a remote load is doing is if you take a look at the image here, is being able to define a load in a remote location, but still have it be linked to the actual model that you run in the analysis on. So let's say for instance, that model had some sort of handle or some sort of component that's imposing a load on the actual geometry that you care about that you want to see stress results and displacement results on, but you don't necessarily want to include that model into the analysis. Uh, so you can get rid of that, that model and say that there is this remote location uh, that we're applying some sort of load, some sort of force or moment that is going to be tied through these rigid bars here onto the actual face. So it's a nice way for you to simplify the analysis uh, without having to include any components that you don't necessarily care about. So that is, again, a reminder of what we can do with this remote load mass, right? So in 2018 and prior to that, this is how the interface looked like, where you had to specify you know, what uh, if you're going to do a load direct transfer or a load or displacement rigid connection. And really what those options were really giving you is you have this reference node here, which is this remote location. And if you were to specify a load direct transfer, you're really saying that the loads and the forces and moments that you're defining at that remote location are being able to transfer uniformly to the actual selected faces. So essentially, you're transferring those forces and moments onto the faces in which it's attached to in order for the model that you're interested in seeing being able for it to, to deform and be able to produce some result. And then the other option that you had there was uh, being able to define a rigid connection, which pretty much means that it's going to define and specify that these coupling faces or the connected faces are going to be treated as or deform as a rigid body. And there were some assumptions linked to that. So again, like if you were doing a low direct transfer, really what that's assuming is that the omitted components are more flexible than the included components that you're running the analysis on, right? Because we're now able to transfer, again, the forces and moments onto that model and for it to deform in some shape, right? So really in 2018 and prior to that, what we're assuming is that those forces and, and uh, those loads are distributed onto the attached face here in a uniform fashion. In 2019, you'll see that the interface, the property uh, manager for uh, remote mass has been slightly updated to accommodate this new functionality of distributed coupling. And you see here that on the bottom, we have these connection types, which include these weight factors. So what the enhancement or what distributed coupling is actually doing is allowing you to select different uh, polynomials or different formulations such as a, a linear uh, weight factor or a quadratic formulation to be able to define different weight factors that are being distributed onto the actual face. So if we were to specify, let's say, like a linear or quadratic uh, formulation as far as this weight factor, that weight factor is being applied on that reference point and then being transferred to the actual coupling face, which is this number four, and it's now distributing the weight in a different type of formulation versus uniformly, which is what the default option was prior to 2019. And really what the benefit is there with doing that and having that functionality is that we're now getting a more accurate result and how these forces, these forces and moments are being transferred to the actual model, All right? So it's just a slight enhancement in how those loads are being directly transferred to the actual geometry is the main enhancement there. And of course, uh, if we were to, you know, do the rigid connection, which is now located here in this connection type, it's really just assuming again that the included components are almost more stiff than the omitted ones, and essentially the entire model is going to deform as a rigid body, right? So we still have the current functionality of a remote mass, but now we have this this distributed coupling that is able to uh, specify these weight factors. Uh, slightly different from what we could do before, All right? So definitely let us know if you have any questions in regards to that, but a very subtle uh, enhancement there for 2019. 
But the major change that we have available to us is uh, some enhancements within a topology study. So just to remind you guys, uh, what is a topology optimization study? Well, for one thing, it was included in 2018, last year, and it was included for our simulation professional and, prof uh, and simulation premium seats. And it utilized this Simulia Abacus technology, which Simulia Abacus being our higher level analysis tool to be able to run uh, analysis on a more complicated you know, type of scenario, it's utilizing that technique for us to you know, have a baseline design like this hinge and have the software be able to iterate through uh, the anal uh, iterate through our, our constraints and our goals to be able to reduce uh, the amount of mass being applied onto the model, yet still increasing the stiffness of the geometry, still keeping that this this component is going to be strong enough relative to how much mass we're eliminating from from the model, right? So it's a way to find this optimal shape of a component based on these optimization goals and constraints that you're able to define. And from there, you know, again, it's increasing the stiffness while reducing maybe some displacement, but ultimately reducing the mass. So that's what a topology optimization is allowing us to do. And it's intended for, um, you know, again, for designers who are trying, who are not really sure on how to, re, how to modify and optimize a current shape to be able to satisfy these design constraints. And these con con design constraints that were included in 2018 are the following, right? And you see that the default option here was the best stress, uh, best stiffness to weight ratio, which is again, being able to specify, I wanna reduce the amount of weight by 50% or whatever percentage, or try to meet a certain goal, yet still keeping a certain stiffness to the actual geometry for it to essentially you know, uh, pass your, your design constraints. And it also included manufacturing controls like uh, being able to define preserved regions, which was selecting faces in the area of the model that you didn't want the analysis to necessarily get rid of material for, right? Or specify thickness controls where again, there's a, that's saying that you want, there's a certain area of the model that you want to retain a certain thickness of the geometry. And it also could account for how this model was going to be extracted from the actual mold if this was going to be, you know, casted or something like that. Um, so we had a variety of different ways to define these goals, constraints, and these and account for these manufacturing conditions in order for us to give us this optimized shape. But this was assuming that we're only really concerned about purely the strength of the geometry, uh, where it wasn't really accounting for whether the, the geometry was going to be in some sort of vibration environment, right? So, of course, when you're running, you know, an analysis or you're thinking about designing a component, you know, one, one of the environments that it might be in is, you know, maybe this is going to be on some sort of shaky, uh, shaky environment where it's vibrating or essentially you want to check where it's not, res uh, that the resonant frequencies don't coincide with, uh, you know, what the input is, is what's causing this vibration because that may cause some sort of issue. Well, now the topology analysis is allowing you to, uh, in 2019, allowing you to define this frequency constraint. So in addition to the inputs that we've discussed as far as the stiffness to mass ratio and you know all those manufacturing controls, we can also add that we don't want the first natural frequency to go beyond or you know maybe we want it to exceed a certain frequency value. And this will again tie in that you want to avoid a certain frequency range, a critical range that you don't want this to resonate in. Right? In addition to that, you know, one of the things that you know many students have asked me in regards to this new tool is can we specifically say I want to optimize to a certain factor of safety or a certain stress and now with 2019 we have that capability. So in addition to what we just discussed, we can specifically say, I want my overall stress to be, you know, some factor of what the yield strength is to ultimately be under what that yield strength is, you know, for it not to go above yield. Or we can spe uh, specifically say, I want my factor of safety to be, you know, two times or whatever it may be, right? So now we can define specifically say, these are my design constraints. This is where I want my stress to be, and it will run this topology optimization to account for these conditions. So let's take a look at how that looks. So 
right now, if I go into that model, which we're looking at this uh, assembly now, give it a sec for it to load up. Right, so there's a couple ways on how you can approach this. You know, you can go straight to a topology analysis. After you turn on the analysis, you can go to new study and you can go and straight up run a topology optimization study. You know, my recommendation is for you to run a linear static analysis on the parent model, which is going to be that yellow piece that's now isolated into this component here. And you see that it's pretty, you know, there's a lot of mass happening there. And ultimately, what I want to know is, can I reduce the, amount, the level of material that's in that model to be able to satisfy certain design constraints? So in 2018, those design constraints, again, included manufacturing goals or including that stiffness to mass ratio and that's what we defined here so we essentially said that for our our constraint we wanted to reduce the mass by 70 percent and that was the only condition that we defined in terms of this uh changing the the actual mass parameter and then we also included that this is going to preserve we want to preserve a certain wall thickness in certain areas of the model and we want to keep it pretty much no more than or no less than 20 millimeters across the entire model. So when we run the analysis there, the output that we get is pretty much a display of the areas of the model that in which you can remove material. And it overlays that with the outline of what the original model looked like. So you see, with the original model here, what this chart is, or what this uh, plot is actually showing us is all the areas that we need to keep within the model for it to still kind of create this level of stiffness that we need based on the load conditions that we applied within the model as well, right? So you still set up the problem like what forces this is going to endure uh, in, in, in addition to those constraints. And you see that from there, it's saying that we can minimize this model to a certain shape like this, and it still will meet our design constraints. So this is what we were able to do with 2018. But with 2019 now adding the functionality of being able to account for, you know, the how this is going to vibrate or trying to avoid a certain natural frequency, you see that we can still include, you know, how much we want to reduce this by, we want to reduce the mass by 70%. But now we can include this functionality where we can specify that the first natural frequency here needs to be greater than 150 hertz. So what that's saying is that we want to avoid any resonant frequency that's below 150. So as long as it's above this 150 mark, then our design will be considered okay, or that's going to follow our design constraint where it's out of that critical uh, resonant frequency range, right? So in combination of that, uh, we can run that analysis again and account for that condition. And you see that the result here is going to be very similar, but you see that it slightly changes where now we can maybe reduce a little bit more uh, more material in these areas here. We get a slightly different shape. So now that it's accounting for this extra condition, you can be a little bit more confident that not only is it going to survive your stress conditions, but it's also going to survive your vibration conditions that you may have within the model itself. Okay. And then as a reminder, what you can do with this result here is being able to export this into some sort of uh, condition where uh, you can either get a graphical representation or export this as a solid or surface geometry to get something similar to this here, where if I activate a configuration that included uh, my model here, uh, bear with me. See if I have one here. So you see that the output that we get from this is this mesh condition where really what how we use this geometry is we overlay it, we use it as a trace configuration where we can now design a new part that references the areas of the model that we can eliminate. So I would throw this into or use this model as a kind of a trace to kind of get an idea of how I can reduce that original plate to this now optimized shape, and then I would rerun the analysis to make sure that it's actually following our stiff constraints that we've defined originally, right? But at the end of the day, 
This is a design tool to help guide you to figure out this optimized shape based on these different strength conditions. Okay, so uh, very exciting enhancements there for, for 2019, specifically for the topology optimization there. But, um, you know, hopefully you guys enjoy the enhancements for all products that involve the analysis tools there uh, for, flow for flow simulation, plastics, and the structural tool here. Um, I do want to remind you here that uh, October is pretty much uh, every webinar Wednesday for the rest of the month, and I believe the first month of November is going to be a what's new webinar here. So here are the following ones. Next week is going to relate to CAM. The week after is going to be our technical communication by Composer, and then we're going to uh, review some highlights of you know overall SOLIDWORKS there. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Uh, we'll be sticking around here for any questions that you may have. But um, if you have any, again, technical questions or any questions for your uh, any sales related questions, feel free to uh, contact your local account representative there or just email us or call us and we can direct you and help you out with any questions you may have. So on behalf of me and Damon, I just want to thank you guys again for joining us and we'll be sticking around here to answer any questions you guys may have. Sylvia, it looks like we got a question from Daniel Carlisle. Um, can you specify a stiffness for the blue lines if they are replacing a part? I think he's referring to the remote load functionality and the, the connecting um, elements between the point mass and what you select on the model. So, I'm sorry, question is if we can specify a stiffness to it? Right, a stiffness for the connecting lines, I think is the question. Uh, so the assumption there is essentially that there are these rigid bars. So unfortunately, there is no capability there um, that allows you to specify how stiff those rigid bars are. But you are uh, essentially controlling that, you know, whatever loads that are being applied on that reference point, you can choose that, that load transfer and those functionality, those loads and uh, moments are going to be transferred to the mass. But the actual stiffness of the bars, unfortunately, are not able to be controlled. Cool. Uh, Ross is asking, uh, when will this webinar be up on the website for later viewing? Ross, it should be posted, I'm going to say, by either the end of the week or early next week uh, to the YouTube channel. So you can go to uh, uh, just YouTube.com and uh, search for Hawker Systems, or you should see a blog post about it on the Hawker Systems website as well. Okay, it looks like we're about done. So thanks again, everyone, for your time, and uh, we'll see you next time.